So here we are in the middle of a message series called Words That Matter, where we have been learning from Pastor John, John, Pastor Don, about the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And throughout these messages, it certainly seems that Jesus was in charge. He took time to pray a prayer of forgiveness for those who were crucifying him. He took time to assure a thief being crucified next to him that he, the thief, would be with Jesus in paradise. And last week, we learned that he took the time to make sure that his mother would be cared for by the beloved disciple. Certainly, Jesus seemed to be in charge. But today's scripture is a little more difficult. Today's scripture might leave us wondering if Jesus finally on that cross, had come to the end of his rope. And so this morning we are going to turn to Matthew chapter 27. Now hear these words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a difference six weeks make. Sammy just read us the scripture about Transfiguration Sunday, which was when I was originally going to deliver this message and COVID intervened. So I asked that the scripture be read today anyhow because of the contrast, because of the difference between that day when Jesus climbed on the mountain with three of his disciples. His appearance was transfigured. His face shone like the sun. His clothes were as bright as light. Elijah and Moses appeared, and they heard the voice of God say, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. God the Father pouring out words of love upon his dear son. But now, almost six weeks have passed. Jesus isn't on the top of the mountain. He's hanging on a cross. And that dearly loved son, his face is no longer shining like a bright light. It's dripping with blood from a crown of thorns. What a difference one week makes. Just a week before, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey with the people waving palm fronds and shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's only a week later, but the people have shouted, crucify him. And now Jesus leaves Jerusalem, walking the Via Della Rosa, dragging a heavy cross upon which he'd be crucified. Nothing Jesus said on the cross, has troubled me more than the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His anguish is unmistakable. His pain is heartbreaking. The injustice of it all is outrageous. His sense of abandonment should break our hearts into a million pieces. What used to really unsettle me, though, 
was that perfect Jesus questioned God. Did it make him less than perfect? Did that question make him a sinner? Had God really forsaken him? Was God just kidding when he said, this is my dearly loved son? You know, they say it's good for us to wrestle with this scripture and other scriptures, but this wrestling match has been too hard. And it's not helped one little bit by how some people have interpreted this scripture. First, we have the Gnostics. Pastor Don mentioned them a few weeks ago as people who thought Jesus really wasn't human, that he really wasn't suffering on the cross, that it was an all, all an act to fulfill some plan by Jesus who was only God and not human. We don't believe that. I don't believe that. Some cl claim Jesus was just fulfilling scripture and quoting Psalm 22 from the cross as if someone could take time to plan out what they're going to say when nails are di driven through their wrists and their feet. And some have labeled the words he spoke as the cry of dereliction. I don't like that label. Who was derelict? When I was in the army, dereliction of duty meant someone failed to do what they were supposed to do. Was Jesus derelict for, answering, for asking the question? No, 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 he was not derelict. He was fully human and his suffering and his cry from the cross is proof positive that he knows our pain, our grief, and our suffering, that he is one with us. He hadn't turned away from God. His prayer said, my God, my God. He asked that question, and in asking that question, he gives us permission to ask the question as well. My God, my God, why did you forsake my child who overdosed? My God, my God, why did you forsake my mother when the drunk driver hit her? as she was crossing the street. My God, my God, where were you when Hurricane Ian destroyed my home? My God, my God, where were you in Turkey and Syria as an earthquake devastated so much of those countries? My God, my God, why did you forsake me as I took chemo that didn't work? My God, my God, why did you let him suffer? A fatal stroke. Jesus asked the question in the form of a prayer, and we can too. We may not get the answer that we want, and sometimes we don't. But what we can be sure of is that God is present. Emmanuel, God with us, is not only at Christmas time, but Emmanuel, God, is with us. In our darkest hours, God cares for and weeps with us, even when we don't get the answers that we want. So is this called the prayer of dereliction because God was derelict in allowing Jesus to suffer on the cross? I don't think so. God watched with a heart that was breaking. I'm sure he cried tears as any parent would seeing a child suffer. But God's presence and response was evident if we continue to read in Matthew chapter 27. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. God was near enough to tear the veil, to shake the earth, to break the rocks, to open the tombs, to convert the murderer. God draws closest when times are the toughest. You know, very often at funerals or 
at the bedside of someone who is dying, we hear the words of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, prayed. But if you look closely at, this, at that psalm, what you'll see, the first half of the psalm, the psalmist is speaking of God in the third person. He's talking about what God does. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down to rest. He guides me beside still waters. He restores my soul. But when it's time to cross the valley of the shadow of death, suddenly God becomes close enough to become you. I cross the valley of the shadow of death and you are with me. You comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. You restore my soul. The psalmist understood that in the darkest hours, God draws near. On the day of the crucifixion, I believe God drew near. But God did not intervene. Because Jesus, who was fully human, was endowed with free will just like us. And he had chosen to go to the cross for us. And God did not intervene, and God let him die. When I'm called to preach on a text like this, I read a lot, hoping someone a whole lot smarter than me will give me an answer. Preparing for this, I read lots of stuff by lots of authors in hopes of finding an answer to the question, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I landed on a couple of books by a man named Philip Yancey. He's a well-known Christian writer, has quite an interesting faith journey. Back in 1977, he wrote a book called Where is God When It Hurts? And 36 years later, he wrote a sequel called the question that never goes away. For 36 years, Philip Yancey struggled with a question that seems to have no satisfying answer. But I found bits and pieces of answers in his books, but nothing that could keep me from wrestling with God. Yancey offers an explanation that was actually offered originally by an Anglican priest named Samuel Wells, very well-educated pastor, the dean of the chapel for a season at Duke Divinity School. But his answer unsettled me. He answered this question by suggesting that for an instant, the Trinity was broken. I don't believe that. I don't believe the Trinity is ever broken. He suggested that the Son had to choose between being one with us or being one with the Father. And that the Father had to choose to either let the Son be with us or to keep the Son to himself. I don't believe the Trinity is ever broken. And I don't believe that Jesus had to choose us or the Father or that the Father had to choose Jesus or us. I believe those were not either or choices but both ands. Jesus chose to love us from the cross so that we could choose to love the Father. And the Father chose to allow Jesus to exercise the will and the choice that he had made to be one with us so that he, the way maker, would provide a way home to the Father for us. The Father didn't intervene, not to ignore the Son, but to allow a way for us to find a path home to him. It's a hard concept to grasp. And the image that came to my mind was a story that I recalled, actually a scene I recalled on television from the Olympics one year. It was after the Winter Olympics were over. All of the medals had been given out. And on the day of the closing ceremony at the ice skating arena, there was a wonderful exhibition skating. No medals were being awarded. No scores were being given. But all the medalists were invited to this exhibition, which began with a pair of ice dancers. 
not figure skating pairs, but the ice dancers. And I never really enjoyed ice dancing because they don't do all those big throws and twirls because the two ice dancers are never allowed to lose touch with each other. They dance and they have to remain in contact. But lo and behold, in the middle of this exhibition, these two ice dancers separated. And when they separated, the gold medalists who had won pairs figure skating joined them. And then a few minutes later, the single skaters joined them. And before you knew it, all of the medalists were out on the ice, and they all joined hands like an ice skating conga line and were dancing around the ice. So imagine, if you will, that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit start out in a dance together, hands joined. And then in one moment in time, they release their hands to allow us to join the dance. The Trinity was not broken, but the circle was widened so that we could join in. Leading into this message today, you sang the hymn, Lord of the Dance. There, were happy, there was a happy verse. You know, I danced in the morning when the world was begun, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun, and I danced, and James and John followed me, and I danced. But we didn't sing the fourth and fifth verses, and the fourth verse reads like this. I danced on a Friday, and the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body, and they thought I'd gone, but I am the dance, and I still go on. And then the fifth verse nails it. They cut me down and I leaped up high. I am the life that'll never, ever die. I live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. That is why the father allowed the son to make his choice and the son made the choice he did so that we could join in the dance. In your moments of anguish, you can cry out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? But don't ever let that be your last word. Instead, remember the dance. Father, Son, and Spirit, letting loose hold on each other's hands, not to be separated or to break apart the Trinity, but to invite us into the circle, to invite us to join in and to hear Jesus saying, dance then wherever Wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance. And I'll lead you wherever you may be. Twice, he says, wherever you may be. He'll take you when you're down and out. He'll take you when you feel forsaken. He'll take you when you're joyful. In good times or bad, agony or ecstasy, despair or hope or joy. We are invited to join in a community that's united in Christ. And, but occasionally, you know, we're like the onlookers that I read about in the scripture at the foot of the cross. Occasionally, one of us will shout out, surely he was the son of God. Amen? But sometimes we sin and we become the mockers, somehow piling on when we see another who's suffering. Or worse, we stand by silently as others exclude and mock, implying that we agree with our science. And at other sacred moments, we're called to be the face of God. For one who cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as we offered love and comfort? Remember this, friends. God will never abandon you. God will never forsake you. We dance with a God who always loves and never forsakes. I do not believe that God forsook Jesus. God allowed Jesus to choose us so that we might choose God. Jesus made the painful choice to redeem us so that we could become one with each other and one with God. 
We have been invited to the dance wherever we may be, but we have choices to make. We can be the wallflower who stays on the sideline like at the seventh grade dance, or we can join in the dance. As for me, I have joined the dance. And many of you have joined the dance as well, but I ask you this. Will you open your hands? We sometimes hold each other too tightly and keep others out. Will you open your hands to let in the vulnerable, the excluded, the judged, the outcast? Will you invite them into the dance? I hope your answer is yes. And that, my friends, is where this message is supposed to end. But I have one more thing that I need to say that just came to me um, actually this morning. It's, it's not on the manuscript. I started this pointing out all the things that Jesus said from the cross that made it seem like Jesus was fully in charge. And then I suggested to you that when he cried out this cry, my God, my God, why had you forsaken me, that Jesus was no longer in charge. I think I was mistaken. Jesus knew it was okay to turn to the Father in times of despair. He was in charge of his own cry. He was in charge of providing a way for us. He was charged. He was in charge all the way. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. Amen.